Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rhonda Seelinger, and I am the Customer Engagement Manager for iClicker. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate your time. We are going to get started here in just a moment. Uh, before we do, I have a couple quick announcements. First, and I'm sure you just heard this, everyone is in listen-only mode. And we do this just to keep out background noise, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you because we definitely do. And how we communicate is via the chat area or the questions area. Um, you're more than welcome at any point in the presentation to ask a question, just typing in uh, in either one of those areas because we do monitor those throughout the presentation and we promise to do our best to address any comments or answer questions. Also, we are recording today's webinar, and we will send you a link shortly afterwards. And we also archive all of our webinars on the iClicker.com website, so you are welcome to access any of our past webinars as well as see um, what future ones we have coming. So we hope you'll check that site out. And with those things covered, I am very pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Selena Lindahl, who teaches economics at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. She enjoys experimenting with new technology and promising pedagogy and is a great advocate with lots of good ideas for incorporating active learning strategies. So, Selena, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, hi, everybody. So glad to be here with you. Thanks for your time today. Um, hopefully, uh, it will be enlightening, as if nothing more than just getting a couple of ideas from another interested instructor and uh, would love to share ideas back and forth. If you would ever like to follow up with me, there's my contact info on the screen, and um, I'm, um, I am a big believer in collaboration, and um, I'm at a school and in a department where uh, research over teaching is uh, the preferred um, incentive structure, and everything else goes along with that, so it's nice, it's really nice to talk to people that are more interested in pedagogy, so um, I'm assuming that's all of you, since you're self-selecting into this group. Um, so thanks for, for your interest and your time and uh, sharing ideas. Um, and if there's at any point, if you have questions, uh, like Rhonda said, there's the chat function. I would love to answer questions at any point. She can um, make that happen. Um, or if you think of questions at the end and uh, want to bring them up then or in the follow-up email or whatever, I'm, I'm very happy to engage that way. So the the topic or the sort of multi-layered topic that I thought um, I would sh I would share with you and we talk about today is this active learning pathways. So we've all hopefully been made aware of, of the idea of active learning or flipped classroom or however you've sort of seen and heard this idea. And I think that it's a little more what it means in, in each of our individual classrooms is is a little trickier, right? So defining the idea of, of active learning and, and sort of getting behind the support and, and you know, looking at the research that seems to suggest that that's a, a better way of learning, more effective way of learning for students is one thing, but how does it actually happen in the classroom and, uh, and why should it happen in the classroom? So I'd like to sort of think about those things um, and show you a little bit about what I particularly do in class and um, see if it resonates with you and see what questions I can ask. So. Um, you'll notice I have in here how and why I keep forcing myself to increase active learning in class. Um, I've been teaching since 1995. Um, this was before PowerPoint. This is before um, before a lot of the learning science that's come out. So I think if you're like me, if you're of a certain age, you sort of um, at the top of that pyramid there, the lecture, which is 5% knowledge retention along this measure, is probably what you came up with, right? Um, what you did in grad school, what you learned, um, in as much as any of us have had pedagogy training as part of our um, part of our grad school, uh, you may have um, done a little bit beyond lecture, but it's it's likely for most of us that there's there's a no pedagogy training and b if there is, it's sort of what we learned, which was straight up lecture. So I. That all that is to say is I am most comfortable in the lecture mode. I love spinning tales. I love telling stories. I'm comfortable there. My students are very much more comfortable there than anything else. And I find that it's a very difficult pull away from that model. Um, and so that so the magnetism that keeps pulling me back to the comfortable uh, lecture model is 
is something that I need to fight against on the regular basis. So I'm, so this is my attempt to, um, to help convince you of that or remind you of that or give you tools to help pull away from that lecture model. Not that there's anything wrong with the lecture model per se, but if student learning is the, um, you know, if we're trying to improve student learning in, in California, we're under um, a lot of pressure to do that, especially um, considering funding issues and considering the number of new students coming into college that are first generation and what have you. It's, it's a difficult task, so we really want to pay attention to the efficacy of what we're doing. So in this, in this um, pyramid here, we have lecture at the top, which is 5% retention, and you go on down, and it, it, as you get towards the bottom, it's clear that the act of learning, that the having to teach others as a student, having to discuss with peers, um, practicing your work in multiple layers of assessment, these are the things that are sticky. Um, so how do we get that done in class? Meet my students and perhaps these are your students as well. So as we're thinking about who we're teaching, not only how we're teaching, but who we're teaching, we wanna think about you know, what, what is her background? What is she coming to class with? So it's a multitasking sort of way of life. Um, very likely that she doesn't read the text before class. Um, it's pretty likely that she's comfortable with programs material, um, especially, so I teach first and second years and um, uh, their self, so their agency and their ability to sort of know how to do school is pretty limited. Um, so in in those ways, they're they're sort of passively waiting for me to tell them how to learn economics. Um, is she tech savvy? Yes. And but I would caveat that I would say to a point. So um, I think you know people like me tend to think about students as um, really um, quite further along the, the learning curve on tech than we are, but I, I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. I think, for instance, when I have problems sometimes with some of my tech, or the students will have problems with the tech, they'll ask, you know, why won't my graph load? And I say, we'll try a different browser. And too many times now I've been asked, what is a browser? To to think, to it, that's helped me to realize that their um, the user interface is so slick and and easy these days that a lot of times they don't see what's going on behind the scenes and that can actually be really detrimental if they hit any um, any issues at all. So they're tech savvy but they're tech savvy to a point um, and I think that's important. So our tech needs to be good if it's if it's um, depending on how much we decide to use it. So again their autonomy and study skills are developing. It's, um, it's not something just like we haven't been taught how learning works as teachers ourselves necessarily, maybe some of us, that's not true. Students also, right? So they're, they don't know exactly how learning works. They don't know how to be an effective student. They do know and like practice questions. So I, I would say this is actually a really good thing. They, their anxiety about what's going to be on the test pushes them to practice, which is actually a really effective learning strategy. So it's nice to have um, those incentives line up. And then, um, Probably this generation um, and a few prior generations as well. I have been overpraised the idea of Carol Dweck's um, growth versus fixed mindset. Um, are they labeling themselves as bad at math or bad at physics or bad at econ or whatever? That's going to be a real block. Um, so, but there's interesting ways to fix that, right? Active learning is one of those ways to fix it. Um, teaching them that that improvement and learning happens through practice is a really good uh, way to counteract this fixed mindset. Okay, so these are our students. And active learning or the idea, whatever it looks like, particularly for us, um, which is mostly sort of a lot more practice questions, homework, applications in class than straight up lecture model, um, can has the promise of doing a number of really good things to their abilities to learn. So for instance, motivation. Um, motivation can flag when you're in a, a pure lecture um, classroom, especially if you're in a semester system and you're now it's you know week 13, week 14. Um, it's difficult right to keep that motivation up. Um, in my classes we teach two days a week for two hours. We're in the quarter system so 
it's a little bit more of a sprint than than a than a slow jog, but we still have the motivation issue a lot a lot of times in our our issues at our school are um, that things are going so fast and I'm teaching a general ed class um, and they're not intrinsically motivated because at a polytechnic school like ours they they think this should all be about job training right. Um, and so the motivation problems can come from a number of sources. However, giving them mastery practice, giving them um, time to work with peers seems to sort of bring up the motivation. Um, also, we get to do more interesting things in class rather than just the basic uh, PowerPoint or um, chalk and talk. And then you can also um, give them real-time feedback, which has a magical effect, um, in my experience anyway, of giving them, you know, um, giving them a feeling for how well they're learning so they get to, to see themselves progressing on the learning curve um, a lot, right? Giving them sort of targets to hit. Um, th those things end up being uh, really motivational as well. And then finally, it, you know, the idea of what does a healthy learning process look like? They're going to be hopefully lifelong learners. So do we model for them that there's this one expert up there that's going to speak at you for 110 minutes and um, then you will have learned it? Um, or do we allow them to be more active in the process themselves? Um, and the classroom is a little more democratic as well, right? If the professor is not just lecturing from on high the whole time, uh, you, you can get, I think, a little bit better um, um, crowdsourcing of ideas. You can get better discussions and you can get, um, you know, it can be chaotic at times. Um, but it can be, but it, it ends up being a lot, um, in my, in my estimation anyway, it being a lot healthier learning process for the things that they're going to be learning for the rest of their lives. So, so those are like, you know, aspirational, um, hopeful things. What actually happens in class? I promised that I would talk about that. So let's talk about that. So the classroom, right? And we all have different types of classrooms. Let me tell you sort of about my classroom. Uh, I've got a couple of quote unquote small classes that are 68 people. And then my large intro to ma macro and microeconomics is 230. I'll show you the classroom in just a minute. But uh, first, it wouldn't do without a little humor. So here's <laughs> Bart Simpson. As you know, when he gets in trouble, he's got a red on the board. This is um, in case you don't want to hurt your neck reading upside down, I will not flip the classroom upside down. All right, so <laughs> a flipped classroom, what does that flipped classroom look like? So maybe you have a really great classroom with tables and movable chairs and um, a co really collaborative space. Or maybe your classroom is just like mine. Um, and the, this is stadium seating. It's got really tiny desks and nothing's movable. And if God forbid you had to get up for a bio break and you're in the center of this one of these rows. You've really got to hassle about 10 to 15 people to get out um, and get where you're going. So it's not it's, it's a very sort of passive, sedentary and um, not set up for collaboration. In fact, I always think about the geography of our classrooms. What are we suggesting that learning is about by the shape of our classrooms and and so this is just to show you that I do not have an ideal classroom for collaborative learning, for active learning. And yet, and yet it still works, I think, it, or it, it still works for me. All right, so um, this, by the way, is a screenshot of a video that I made. I, I find that when you are um, changing up your pedagogy, so maybe you've done some flipped uh, or some active learning work before, maybe you're just thinking about it, flirting with the idea. The students, I think, um, will accept it better and will um, engage better with it if you let them know sort of why you're doing this, right? So if what I did is I made a quick video and I said, okay, this is um, this was actually a hybrid class. So we met once a week and they did a lot of online work um, the other day of the week. And I said, you know, on Tuesdays, we're going to show up and this is, you know, this is what we'll do. And on Thursdays, your classroom is, and I had a picture of somebody on a sofa, um, and here's what you do. And here's all the different parts of your learning in class, we're not going to be lecturing. We're going to be working on problems together. Um, and the, you know, the baseline, uh, getting all the terms understood by you, working through basic graphing, that's stuff that you do at home. Um, so letting them know sort of the different pieces of their education, uh, or at least 
the learning objectives that you have designed for them, um, I think helps them see. And I, I, it's not never a bad idea to also show them some of the um, some of the efficacy studies about active learning. There's some really good ones out there. And then I'll show you. Hey, Selena. I'll share with you a couple of. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hey there. Um, someone had just asked if you have any aisles to move through the whole room. Um, yes. So there's in this classroom, um, there's an aisle right down the center. So I can go all the way up to the top and, and back down. And actually, so that what what's interesting about that is if you have an Apple TV or a really long cord, <laughs> you can do it wirelessly. There's actually workarounds too. So if you've got an iPad or something where you can walk around, um, yeah, it's helpful. Does that answer the question enough? Yep, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so this is, so I, framing for them sort of the pedagogy of what's happening and why, um, and I can point you to some of those papers and, and books that, um, that are helpful. But in the end, it's this idea of um, harnessing the social energy that they already have. Um, maybe they're introverted, maybe they're not. Um, maybe they're, some of them are more social than others, but there's always um, a benefit from working with peers, um, and that is that, that they are, they're naturally wanting to associate. So, um, so I say why fight it? Why ask them to, to keep shutting up for the full two hours, because I'm trying to talk here, <laughs> and letting them do um, some of what they want to do anyway, which is to engage with each other. So um, the first, I, I would say this is, would be my first choice. If I were just curious about pedagogy and trying to figure out, like, all right, so I want to do something different in my class, what I'm um, not happy with what I've done, or I'm happy with what I've done, but I know there's, there's other things I could be doing. How Learning Works is a wonderful book. Um, it's very pra practical, pragmatic. It's got a bunch of case studies, and then it's got Acts, um, you know, the lit review or the, the sorry, the um, the sources are um, the best ones out there, right? So they'll they'll point you um, to papers that have um, that that are sort of what their whole seven arguments are based on. So I actually teach a learning community, uh, co-lead a learning community at, at our Center for Teaching and Learning that uses this book as the backbone of sort of how to teach better in large lectures. Um, that's that's sort of who we're, our our community is. We're trying to f figure out like where is the most bang for the buck, and that is well, if we get teachers in really large lecture halls to to pay attention to active learning, we can affect a lot more students. Um, but also, the if if you happen to be uh, in a large lecture hall, you know that the the struggle is real, right? That it's even more difficult to give everything, to give a lot of assessment, to give students real-time feedback. These things are um, a very real issue, but they're not without um, solutions. So that's the good news. So from this book, How Learning Works, um, they address some of the key problems that, that block learning, right? So motivation is so crucial, um, and motivation is absolutely um, determined uh, determine student success, right? You, it's not magical. Um, you can't just turn on and off motivation that easily, but it can be guided and stimulated somewhat by how we do the class. So motivation is important. Mastery, right? Giving them time to practice, um, especially first-generation students or underrepresented minority students or students for whom English is not the first language. Um, they benefit um, the, probably the most, and some of the research suggests this benefit the most from um, flipping the classroom. From, from, for instance, and I'll show you exactly what I do for the out of class experience, but giving them access to videos and whatnot that allow them to sort of rewind when they need to, as many times as they need to, without um, embarrassment or without holding back the class. If they, you know, if they, if they're in your classroom and they don't understand because you're going too fast, it's um, they're probably, many of them probably not going to stop the class to ask, especially in a large lecture. Um, and so you, we think about, you know, um, how to, how to improve success for all of our students, um, including, including the most vulnerable. So mastery is, um, is productive for students, right? Mastery practice. Um, feedback should be goal-directed and targeted. Um, 
So I'm gonna talk a lot about how I do iClicker polling in class. Um, that's one of the ways that I've overcome the, the problem of not being able, not having any TAs and yet having 230 students that I wanna give feedback to. Um, course climate also matters. And course climate, I think um, this is in, in probably in every school, the, the issues with climate are going to be different. But if we think about sort of the deer in the headlights uh, look that our first and second years, especially first years have, or first generation students, um, it's the, the lecture model, I think, um, and perhaps you agree, perhaps you don't, but the, the lecture model can be pretty chilly depending on, um, on the size of the class and depending on how passive the, the learning environment is. So warming up the climate, um, engaging students with each other is, uh, is something that I think active learning can. And, and um, So collaborative learning really is what the, the in-class experience is about, at least part of the in-class experience. I still do miniature lectures, but um, thinking about um, you know, making sure the students are engaged with each other quite frequently. So if all these things matter, right, climate, uh, motivation, feedback mastery, how do, we, how do we collect that in a bottle and, and do it, especially if you have a, a large um, classroom? It's, it's a challenge, right? So I don't, I don't want to sit here and say, oh, it's just wave your magic wand and um, write a new syllabus and it's all going to be better. Um, it's, it's work, right? It's less work. So I actually am a, I'm an author for the PowerPoints for some textbooks, some of the leading textbooks in economics, and I, I love my PowerPoints and I find it really hard to uh, walk away from them and to do this active learning um, because it's so it's so time consuming to develop materials, um, especially the, the sort of higher order thinking that is required. So, you know, now you know the definition. Now you know how to graph the demand curve. Let's see if you can apply it to this real world real world scenario. That's that's the key. Right. And that's um, that's the difficulty. So luckily for me in economics and maybe this is true for you. There's current events happening every day that that we can um, chew on in class, but those current events maybe don't happen exactly at the right time uh, for when we're covering them, or um, or we don't quite have the support yet with a you know with the um, what's been done with the textbook and the teaching. Um, but it can be very fun to sort of ride the wave of what are students interested in, um, and we can find that out actually by by asking them directly, especially with um, in-class polling systems. So how do you collect the grades? Managing large classes, yeah, that, that's, that's the trick. But to me, that's less of a trick now with some of the classroom technology that we have, like iClickers and other um, polling software. But something that's overlooked is moving in the direction of away from lecture towards active learning is changing your identity with the class. And, and that's um, not the easiest for some of us, like I mentioned, I, I actually really enjoy lecturing. I really enjoy connecting with students or at least the feeling of connecting with students with a narrative or coming up with a new way to explain something. Um, and, and I still do these, these mini lectures, but the idea of me being a co-learner or a guide on their journey through the material is, um, it's, it's just, it's a real shift. Um, so giving up that idea of the sage on the stage um, and that's how learning happens. And all learning is, all knowledge passes through me into your ears. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a comfortable um, but false narrative. All right. So that's Rihanna, by the way, giving, I don't know if she's putting on or taking off the crown, but um, for my narrative, she's taking off the crown because she's about to, to engage in active learning. All right. So here's what, here's the, the path that I went through as I am figuring out how to do this in my class. Is there anything that's ar that has already been invented? Do I have to reinvent the wheel? Um, especially, you know, is it ADA compliant? Um, it, are there already embedded questions in there that maybe I could use? And for economics, what I landed on was something called Flip It Econs. It's a set of um, animated videos with questions um, built into the videos, and there's um, three different sets of questions. One of the set of questions is, is really nice 
um, because it asks students to justify their answer. So even though I don't have time to read them all, the fact that students can are forced to go through and say, all right, so I think the demand curve shifts to the right because blah, 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 and they're forced to do that sort of um, one step beyond guessing, right? Or maybe two steps or three steps beyond guessing. But that, so that, so I found something like that. Um, depending on your particular discipline, you may have something that uh, fits, or I'm sure you have something at least that gives a little bit of, um, you know, background. And and we all have access to test banks, so you can actually just pull um, questions out of test banks. But here's, so here's exactly. Um, the learning process that I um, have set up for my students. So the students encounter the material, right? And so these are little screenshots of the videos that they see um, from the Flip It Econ. I also, um, because sometimes I need to add more material or there's, there's stuff that this particular um, video bank doesn't have that I want to cover, um, I've made a few explainer videos as well. And, and so there's a lot of um, easy ways to do that. I, I have finally let myself um, not feel guilty for putting out less than perfect material. Um, there's just, you know, students just need a quick five minute explainer video on something. It's okay if my dog barks in the middle of it or if, um, you know, I have to say um a few too many times. Um, that, see, there I go. That, uh, that's okay. So they encounter the material. This is videos that they watch at home. Then they do some questions. So they actually, um, one of the platforms I use get, makes them do um, pre-lecture questions. So they, they watch these videos, then they, before class comes, they've got to answer questions about the videos, basic terminology, um, kind of low level stuff, right? I don't want to ask them too high of a level thing because I don't know if, you know, if they will be able to understand it. Sometimes we need to work through things in class for the higher order stuff. So, um, they actually do a like an individual quiz at home. Um, they have an adaptive learning engine on uh, one of the platforms that I use that that uh, works pretty well. So it gives students, and most publishers have some sort of adaptive learning solution these days. Um, so adaptive learning is nice um, because it'll give students sort of um, tailored feedback, right? Hey, Selena. So, um, yeah. Sorry, I, <laughs> we had a question yeah. pop up. Um, is there a best length of video lecture um, that you have found so, yeah. for the students? That's that's a really good question. I when I started making videos on Camtasia, and sometimes I make them on my iPad in um, Explain Everything. Uh, it's very easy to talk for fifteen to twenty minutes. I find that was my first foray. Is oh, the fifteen to twenty minute chunks. That's shorter than what I do in class. That's got to be good. But if you look at the professional stuff that's out there, like these Flip It Econs are two to five minutes, rarely more than four minutes. Um, and I think the smaller chunks, uh, the, from what I've read, the smaller the chunk, the better. So um, we really try to stay under five minutes. I think you're more successful because uh, the students will be watching it. They'll be walking to class and watching it on their phone or they'll be, um, you know, they don't have necessarily that the three hours block of study time that we think they do. Um, so yeah, I think short, the shorter, the better, although it takes, <laughs> it takes a lot of discipline to make your stuff really short. But if you can just think of module, uh, making everything really modular, um, that's, I think that's helpful. Does that answer the question Thanks. enough? I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So your, your short videos and then, um, and the quizzes and so where does a textbook fit in here, right? Uh, that's the question. So maybe you have a textbook, maybe you don't have a textbook. Um, I find that students, most of them report that they, uh, they, they don't do what probably most of us think they do or, or would hope they do, which is to read the textbook uh, from the, the beginning of the chapter to the end, including all the interesting application boxes and everything else. And, uh, because that's where, you know, we think that's maybe where the engagement comes in is to the uh, current event that's that's posted in the textbook. They don't do that. They, um, in in my view, they are looking to the test or looking to the quiz or looking to um, any questions they know they're going to have to answer. And then they're um, 
they're dropping into the material just to answer those questions. So they're more, a little more dilettante-ish about, um, about what they learn. So especially in my class, it's, it's a general ed. Nobody, very few people are econ majors in the class. So they, they see it as a necessary evil, or at least at the beginning of the quarter they do. So that's how they do it. And um, so I think that matters, right? So, so I tell them I, up front, I say, look at, so you may choose to look through the textbook. Um, I would actually recommend that you do it that way. At least you sort of skim it in order because I, I do find one of the things that we need to be careful about when we do active learning is that students, well, it's not just with active learning actually, any student these days that's, that's probably not reading the textbook in linear order is gonna miss out on the context and it's gonna miss out on um, some of the, the beautiful color commentary that goes through, that runs through the textbook and also the order at which things appear. Um, if, they're, if they're just popping in and looking for a specific definition, they're, they're not going to get the whole picture. So I would say as an aside in class, I try to do more of the sort of contextualizing and mapping out the, um, the topics for them and how they fit together because that's one thing that, that I think has been lost as students have moved away from um, being good textbook readers, if they ever were good textbook readers. So, um, so the other way I'm giving them guidance besides just showing them the the overall um, outline is to to say, all right, here's the guidance. Here's the kind of questions that I think are important about this material. So in class, we do this formative assessment and peer instruction. What that looks like is they're um, talking with each other. Uh, I usually just say, all right, discuss amongst yourselves. Sometimes I'll have it be a, like a private, everybody answers individually, and then we'll see how people do. If the, if 80 or 90% of people are getting it right, we move on. If it's like 50 or 60 or 70%, I'll say, all right, I'm not going to tell you what the right answer is, but turn to your neighbor and convince them that your answer is the right one or ask them why they answered how they answered. So the idea of peer instruction um, as a way to um, get everybody in class get their specific questions answered and maybe they don't they're not answered well because it's a peer that doesn't know what he or she's talking about but at least they vocalize the question now that question is is they've sort of committed to realizing what their issue is um, or, or why they didn't get the question right and and then from there the questions bubble up to me so if their questions aren't answered in their little peer groups and by the way every time i i do this one two punch of an individual then a peer discuss amongst yourselves and come up with see if you're going to change your answer the scores always improve the second time they never go the other way so i have to think there's something really effective about um, getting with each other and vocalizing your thought process um, and to be sure if it's still a really hard question then they're frustrated they haven't got their answer from each other and now they ask me but at least every person has been able to discuss unlike the lecture model where um, sort of, you know, if if 60% of people got it right, the so 40% are going, oh, crap, I don't know what, well, I don't want to hold the class up, right? Um, so it's it's a way to sort of catch the problems before they get too large, I, I think, I hope. And then that gives me the, the agility and the information to, um, to give a mini lecture or to explode on a topic um, that needs um, some brilliant commentary. <laughs> so that is Ben Stein, if you don't recognize, uh, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, talking about economics in a very stimulating, exciting way. All right. So um, what what happens next then, and what there's what this clears time for, and what I really advocate for is this um, the, the deeper application exercises. So this is where. Um, I am stealing ideas from other people all the time. Um, and actually a group of us are working on an NSF uh, project right now that is specifically designed to develop these application exercises. So you, you ask a bigger, harder question and have them get in groups and work on it. This is where, um, this is where I think the, one of the other real benefits of, of active learning is. And I wanna back up for just a second um, about these clickers, just so you know what's happening. Um, the my so this is an opportunity with Clicker that you can do, and and Clicker I think um, 
you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think is the only one where you can have the choice of half the students having um, physical handheld remotes and, and other students having an app. So I always tell them whatever's more cost effective for you, um, you know, use the app or use the, the physical remote. Uh, they both work and they work pretty seamlessly together. So it's, it, it's uh, for cost reasons, I let them choose. If they already have a clicker, just bring that. But if not, it may be cheaper to use the app, pretty inexpensive. So they get their feedback in real time. They get to see if they're right or wrong. You get that collective gasp or shouts of joy when I show up on screen the, the histogram of what, um, you know, how students answered. And I'll show you what the histogram looks like because um, there's some fun things you can do with it if you're using iClicker. So um, I use Sapling Plus. This is a specific publisher um, uh, solution. This very last quarter I was beta testing it, so I went away from the Flip It Econ to this. Um, and it had some of the similar things. In fact, it embedded some of the Flip It Econ stuff inside. So just to let you know, this is like pre-class, this is what they do, they have these videos, um, and then they had their adaptive learning quiz, and then afterwards, um, they do a longer, a deeper homework uh, once a week. Um, so it's a pretty busy week, right? So this happens twice a week. There's two of these sets of pre-class, um, but if you think about each of these only being two to three minutes, um, you know, it's really, it's, it's not a huge outlay of time for them, or it doesn't feel like it anyway for them. Um, and then they get to spend more time and then optional practice quizzes. And I get to see on the adaptive learning over here in the left, sort of where the problems are. So this is one way for me to sort of slice um, and view where the, you know, be a little proactive in figuring out where the issues are before class. And then in class, um, you know, because this isn't, this isn't that granular, in class I can get more specific with what questions I want. And sometimes I don't know what the questions are until the students, until we encounter it in class. And so I like to be, um, one of my favorite things to do is to just write questions on the fly because something will occur to me from what somebody just said. I'm like, oh, they're misunderstanding this aspect. Let's, let's ask a question and make that, um, make that aspect of it a lot more clear and, and people can see where the, their thinking went wrong. Um, and so I will just ask questions on the fly. I have used um, Top Hat, I've used Learning Catalytics, I've used um, most of the other polling software and um, they're all great. What frustrated me was that I wasn't, I would like to be able to do more on the fly um, uh, questions and so iClicker fits with me very well. I didn't, I don't have to preload anything into it. Selena, um, there's a question, uh, do you limit yourself to multiple choice questions? Mm. Right, so so actually, yeah, let me jump to that, sort of what questions we do. Um, um, okay, so in class with, with uh, because I'm giving students so many options of, of the clickers, um, including so ones that just have the A through E, in the class, yes, it's multiple choice. Online, it's, you know, any number of different iterations of graphing and drag and drop and sorting, et cetera. So, um, so that is a limitation, but I've actually found that it's not so much of a limitation. Let me jump ahead to um, what to, to show you some of the different ways that multiple choice questions I think can be made more creative. Um, so these are just things I pull from. Um, you know, NPR has a marketplace. There's Freakonomics Radio. There's whatever for your discipline that exists out there. Maybe there's a repository of other people that have created some interactive lecture stuff. Um, maybe there's a cohort of, you know, people that are sharing um, classroom materials, which is always great. I always find that there's not quite enough incentives to make that enough for, you know, there's not enough on offer for me, and so I've always got to go scrambling. But, um, but if we if we focus on the questions being a really good driver of things, there's no end to the number of questions that you can. Um, that you can ask or devise even on the fly. So one more thing, one more little pedagogy before we talk about these questions. It is three times or more um, a student needs to hear the question or needs to be tested on something um, to get a really good jump in their cognitive um, ability around that question. So uh, you can get their performance improved 11% if you revisit questions. So this can be like 
a question about the topic that we did last time, um, just to keep you fresh on it, right? And so you're leaving, interleaving that on, along with some new material. Um, that's really um, stre stretches and confuses the brain and makes this, the learning that much more sticky. So although we teach in little modules, the testing, um, the assessment can be and should be, I think, in sort of in longer strands. So here's the other book. I'm Derek Ruff, Teaching with Classroom Response Systems. There is a whole a myriad of types of questions. Um, um, and I think most of us, when we think about multiple choice questions, or at least like clicker type questions in class, we're thinking about, you know, basic recall, basic facts, basic um, stuff that, you know, we put on a multiple choice exam, especially sort of lower level. Um, and that's good, but you can also get deeper, right? You can get um, application, critical thinking perspective, um, ex you can do experiments, you can do confidence level monitoring. I'll just show you, um, I don't want to take too much time, but I'll show you a couple of different types of questions that um, are a little bit, perhaps a little bit outside the box. So this is one of the most emotional days in my class is always when, when I <laughs> offer this question. So basically answer A or B if you're a student. Right? If everyone answers A, 100% of the class answers A, all 230 of you, you all get five points. But if it's less than 100%, anybody that answers B gets one point, and people that answered A get zero points, right? And so maybe I'll let them make announcements or try to con convert each other to um, answering A. They all always think everyone's going to answer A. and I've never had a class where we've had 100% A. So this is an important topic in, in economics called game theory, sort of like the balance of your own um, personal self-interest with the, the interest of the group. Um, and we get uh, a lot of good discussion around sort of why would you defect an answer B or why did you think everyone, why did you trust everyone so much to answer A when you know that um, the incentive structure is actually designed to get, get people answering B. So anyway, that's, that's a, sort of a little game. You can gamify um, in other ways as well, but that's one way that, um, that I like to do in class. I did have one student um, get so upset by the, <laughs> the performance of his classmates that he got up and slammed the door and left, did not come back. <laughs> so um, in, for the most part, uh, things go pretty well and it's a good, it's a good discussion. Uh, so you can have recall questions. This is out of my discipline, but you know, what, what's the definition of velocity? Um, and students can rem try to remember that. I wanted to show you this. This is just a snapshot of something I pulled from a test bank. Because I think we need to remember that our test banks have, if you have a test bank, it most likely has things labeled and leveled for you. So this gives you um, what level of Bloom's cognitive taxonomy is on there. Um, is it a difficult? or easy question, um, what topic is it? Especially because I used to be a, uh, the director of assessment for our College of Business, so accreditation stuff, right? Sometimes you, um, you can actually really uh, pay attention to your labels and, and really help out your, your assessment if you're involved in assessment for your school. Um, this, a big problem for econ is um, basic graph ability. Um, for most of our students. So this is just a simple question about do you understand how if wages get more sticky, which means basically they, they don't adjust um, very quickly over time, what does that do to your graph? Because if your students are like mine, they just try to memorize stuff like this that has any sort of mathematical or graph component to it, um, the ones that don't like math or um, sort of more conceptual thinking they try to avoid the learning, but you want to steer them right into the learning. So that's to me what, um, so this is, this is a multiple choice question, but really it's a graph question because now they're going to be drawing in their notes sort of what they think the solution is, or they're going to be trying to reason it through. Um, application questions. Okay, here's, so here's uh, an event that happened in the 70s. What do, you, what do you think that's going to do to your, to your graphs? Critical thinking questions. This I learned from a, um, an instructor at UC Berkeley. 
all right, so we talked about a lot of things today. What's the most important thing in your mind, right? So making them do the metacognition of uh, what did we learn? What, what's the most important thing? What, what does my teacher think the most important thing is, right? Um, and then you could go through and talk about, this could be an answer, like I would, I would not have a right answer on this. I would give everyone credit for answering the question. Um, but I would, I would walk through with them because they're going to want to know what I thought the answer was, right? Um, because they want to know for the exam, they want to know for their grades, um, how does, how do things happen? So I'm helping them organize the thoughts, right? I'm helping them, I'm helping show them the hierarchy in my mind and the, um, the hierarchy of the material and where the concepts fit together. Hey, Selena, um, how many yeah. icebreaker questions do you typically ask in a lecture period? Uh, so that's a good question. It's usually between five and ten. Sometimes I'll go crazy and do more, um, but it's usually between five and ten questions. So I, I try to have that rule of not more than like ten minutes of me talking before we do something active. And if you do it right, you answer, you ask a question like this um, that, that this ethics policy class at Brown asked, and you'll you won't be able to shut them up. This this discussion will go on for a long time. Um, and so your problem will be <laughs> to get back to the material. But this can, if you have a couple of these kinds of questions that maybe um, just in your back pocket that may or may not relate directly to your material on that day, um, it will um, kickstart that engagement like, like nobody's business. And I know that we're, I don't want to um, keep us too long past because I want to give time for some questions. So let me um, show you sort of one other something you can do with iClicker, and that's demographics. So I, um, yesterday we were talking about, I forget what we were talking about in my poverty and discrimination class, but um, I had them vote on something, and then I showed them the percentage of um, of different majors. Like, so th this one you could look at gender. Um, I showed them sort of, all right, accounting majors were more clustered in this answer, and marketing majors or uh, engineering majors were more concentrated over here, um, and they, they're, they're always very curious about that. So you can design your own demographics questions. Um, uh, one that I add always is, uh, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Because I sometimes think that that matters um, to questions. Or you know, what political party are you affiliated with? Um, none, of my, none of the Republicans in my class yesterday knew that the Pulitzer Prize had just been awarded to a hip hop album. Um, for music this time, which um, they thought was funny. They thought it was funny that they didn't know that. Um, so anyway, so you can slice and dice, but the basic idea is you can jump in anywhere here, right? You can, you can lecture and then ask questions, or you can ask a question and have the students vote, and then maybe you lecture based on how much you need to lecture, but it's the idea, Eric Mazur, um, over, uh, um, over, Harvard, I think he was at the time anyway, um, developed this idea of peer instruction. So you're, the power of, of having students talk to each other than vote can really be just about at any time. And um, finishing up, so I'm going to interleave you three times with this idea. There's, there's one more after this. This is just that remembrance, remembering the, the idea of um, how important active learning is, we think, in the stickiness. So how did it work? How did my students do after I initiated these sort of what I call pretty big changes? Um, well, the muscles did get stronger. <laughs> um, I, this, is, this is preliminary results. This is not a clean experiment by any means because I changed too many things at once to know exactly what the, you know, what the magic pill was. But um, I gamified, I added, um, Mob Lab, which is some gaming uh, software for them. Uh, we added a bunch of uh, peer instruction in class, and I added these videos and plus my own. So flip the class. How did we do? Um, I did this for the Chancellor Office. This was a project where I um, sort of reported back to them. Before the redesign of my class, the DFW, the percentage of students getting Ds, Fs, or withdrawing was at 12.6. Um, and then afterwards, it was down to 3.12. Um, was that grade inflation? Was that something with how I, I changed my grades? I also tried to 
um, um, control for that by asking, I asked some standardized questions in both sets of, of students. So the TUS is the te National Test of College Understanding and Economics, and they improved their performance on that after the redesign. So um, my conclusion was I didn't hurt anybody, and I probably helped some people, um, or I just got a really the, the best class in the world that, that was going to do well anyway. But I, I'd like to think it was something in the, in the course design that ended up being um, effective. So, so I am not, I, I, I'm convinced, even though my comfort is to go back um, and to lecture at them for two hours, I'm convinced by the, um, by the research that in team-based learning, the group is always smarter than the individual. And the fact that you add that to motivation and engagement, um, those are all helped by team and peer-based learning as well. Um, I'm sold on it. And I think that um, if, we're, if, if instructors are serious about uh, student learning and if administrators are serious about student learning, we would start treating this as, um, as the default way that students should learn. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I'd love, I know we have maybe just a few minutes if you have questions or, um, or want to share any ideas that you have. So thanks you guys for your time. Yep, that's great. Thank you so much, Selena. I think that was uh, really interesting and a lot of things for people to think about. Um, we're happy to hold on for a few seconds while you, uh, you know, if you have any questions or want to make any comments, again, you can use either the chat or the question area and we'll hang out. If we don't see anything pop up, that's fine. I know, um, you know, y'all are busy and, and have things to get to, so that's fine too, but we'll, we'll hold off and keep this open for just a couple minutes. Okay, let's see. Oh, someone asked if there's a way to view this webinar again. There absolutely is. We are recording it, and we are going to send everyone who registered a link out to the recording. So uh, look for that within the next day or so. We're getting some good jobs and thank yous, <laughs> which is great. Mm -hmm. Always happy to hear good feedback. Um, all right, well, I'm not seeing anything extra come in, so um, definitely want to thank everybody again. And Selena, thank you so much. I really do appreciate um, the thoughts that you shared. Oh, wait, somebody raised their hand here. Um, if there's a hand raise, actually what I need is, is for the chat uh, to either put it in chat or questions because I can't uh, I can't do anything with a raised hand, but that could have been by mistake too. Okay, here we go. Thanks. <laughs> do you do any team assignments outside of class? It looks like it would be hard in your physical space. Um, well, so in that particular, so in my other, in my higher classes, my, my 300, 300 level classes, so juniors and seniors, they do a bunch of that. Um, in this class, the only thing they do that's team outside of class is an optional, uh, rockonomics video. So they, they have to remake a song in, with economics lyrics and then perform it, make a video. Um, but that's, it's extra credit. They don't have to do it. But you could. I mean, there's nothing to stop you from from doing that. And <laughs> so I guess I guess really, I, I know that students are doing their homework together sometimes, um, and so that's in a sense a team a team environment, I suppose. All right, great, thank you. Someone had asked about getting a certificate, and I think what we typically find is that the email that we send, um, you know, acknowledges that you had attended, so hopefully that uh, will suffice for you. If not, uh, you're welcome to email me separately. I am going to put my email address in the chat area.
All right, I'm just double checking through the Q&A area, make sure I didn't miss anything, but it looks like we are caught up. And uh, that's great. I think we're coming up on time. And um, again, just thanks again to everybody. I hope you all have a great day. I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. And um, you, like I said, you're more than welcome to reach out to me or, or Selena directly afterwards. And uh, be looking in your inboxes for our follow-up email with the recording. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks, everybody. Day. Bye. Bye-bye.